All right, we are up to section 1.5, differentiation techniques, the power and the sum and difference rules. Differentiation techniques, this is going to be probably very welcome to you because <clears throat> after doing section 1.4, where we learned how to take a derivative using the limit of the um, difference quotient, this is going to make things a lot quicker <clears throat> and a lot easier for us to find derivatives. Remember, differentiation is the process of being able to take the derivative. All right, so our objectives, we're going to use different, uh, we're going to differentiate using the power rule or the sum and difference rule. Uh, we're going to differentiate a constant or a constant times a function, and we're going to determine points at which a tangent line has a specified type of slope. Uh, some of the vocabulary will get into this thing called Leibniz notation, uh, the power rule, and the sum and difference rule. Okay, so as it says here, before we get started with differentiation techniques, let's discuss some of the notation for derivatives. We've already seen the f prime notation, f prime of x. That's going to be useful most of the time, but sometimes the um, function is not defined in terms of a, an f. It might be a y equals, and if that's the case, um, where y is actually going to equate to our function, like y equals f of x, then you might use this other notation right here, which is said dy dx. You can say dy over dx. That's perfectly fine. For whatever reason, we've shortened it in math to just to say dy dx. Um, that's this middle notation right here. And then the last notation is d dx of f of x. Kind of a weird one to say that one right there. And I'll explain what that means here in the next line. So the notation dy over dx, it's actually called Leibniz notation because um, Gottfried Leibniz was the um, <clears throat> mathematician who, who penned this specific notation. He is one of the co-creators of calculus. And what it should remind you of is the d part, um, the dy over dx, it kind of looks like a change in y over a change in x, which is just a slope notation. Um, change of y over x, rise over run, um, any way you want to think about it. So um, the notation d over dx has to be understood as a command. Okay, so that's one big thing. Let's look back at this right here. If we look at this one right here, a lot of people think, oh, it's d over dx times f of x. But this is a function, so it's telling you d over dx is telling you you're going to take the derivative of f of x. So anytime you see that notation, whether the y is on top or whether the y is off to the right or whether the f of x is off to the right, the d over dx notation tells you take the derivative. So that's what we're going to do. So for example, the um, example that says here is f prime of 2 equals dy over dx and then the little bar coming down the right hand side means evaluate the derivative at x equals 2. So that's what it's telling us to do. All right, there's your notation. Let's get into the power rule because this is probably the most useful rule for all of derivatives. It kind of is the basis here. So we made you go through finding some derivatives using the difference quotient. <clears throat> and that still is extremely important because it's actually the basis for this. When we took the limit of the difference quotient, we would get our derivatives. There's a rule that makes this much, much easier. If you have a function that has the form of x to the k power, like it, whoops, like it says right here, x to the k power, x is always going to be your base where k is just some kind of a number. If you look at this chart, hopefully you can start to see a pattern. The first one is x. Well, that's really the same as x to the first power. If you take the derivative, it's 1 x to the 0 power. So the derivative of x to the first, or just x, is 1 x to the 0. But anything raised to the 0 power, other than 0 itself, is 1. So technically, that right there is just 1 times 1, which is 1. Look at the second one. It's going to start to make a little more sense. x squared, if I take the derivative, it's 2 x to the first. Or you don't really have to write the first power because the first power is understood, so it's just 2x. If you look at the third one, 
x cubed. The derivative, without going through the whole difference quotient, is 3x squared. Let's look at a couple of different ones. Hopefully you're starting to get the idea of the pattern here. <clears throat> if we look at the square root of x, which can be written as a power as x to the 1 half. Well, the derivative of that is 1 half x to the negative 1 half. Okay, let's look at one more and then I'll explain it, which you've probably seen below here already. But uh, 1 over x can be rewritten as x to the negative 1. So again, it can be written as x to some power, which is x to the negative first power. Well, the derivative of that is negative 1 x to the negative 2. Hopefully what you've realized is all you're doing is you're bringing the exponent out to the front of the x, and then you're going to subtract 1 from the exponent or reduce the exponent by one, by one number. So in general, if we were to take the power rule, the power rule says that if f of x equals x to the k, then f prime of x equals k, bring down the exponent, and then reduce the exponent by 1 minus 1. The biggest thing is, and I will say this and hopefully you guys will catch on, the biggest thing is the base must be x or whatever your independent variable is that's in the function. Okay, that cannot be something else. It cannot be a number. It cannot be um, some other kind of whatever. I can't even think of it. It can't be like a log or something like that. It must be x. Okay, it's got to be your independent variable. We'll get into how you work with the other ones in a later section. All right, let's practice some of these because I do believe that some of these, this is probably one of the easiest things to do. <clears throat> the hardest thing will be transforming some of these things into powers if they don't already look like powers. So the first one, y equals x to the fifth. Notationally, you need to be able to write some kind of a derivative. Now, one thing we didn't show is you could write this, and there's another way to write this. I'm not going to go through that. If you happen to see it and you happen to use it, I'm okay with it, but I'm not actually even going to mention it right here. So since I started off with y, one of our notations was dy over dx. So the derivative dy over dx is, now use the power rule, bring the 5 out front and then reduce the power by 1, 5x to the 4th. That's the derivative. That is much, much quicker than it would be to use the difference quotient. The difference quotient would be a real pain in, the, in this case. Okay, letter B. <clears throat> Once again, we're going to go with dy dx for the derivative. dy, that's a y on top, dx. Now reduce the power, I'm sorry, bring the um, exponent out to the front, negative 4 and then reduce the power of the x by 1. Now make sure you are subtracting 1 from this. Negative numbers go in the other direction. So negative 4 minus 1 is now negative 5. Don't go the other way. Okay, letter C. We have to rewrite letter C first because that's not actually in a power notation just yet. I have to make x raised to a power. Well, that's the fifth root, so that is x to the 1 fifth power. Now I'm ready to take the derivative. So dy over dx, bring the 1 fifth out to the front, and then reduce that by 1. Well, 1 fifth minus 1 is negative 4 fifths. And you will have to become pretty good at adding and subtracting 1 to um, exponents. <clears throat> All right, one more. Got a little bit more work to do here on this one. Got y equals the cube root of x squared times x to the, oh, excuse me, square root of x to the fifth power. So the first thing we need to do is we need to rewrite both of those in terms of powers. Well, the cube root of x squared, when you rewrite that as a power, it's always power over root for your exponent. So it's really going to be x to the two thirds power because the power is a square, the root is a cube, so it's two thirds power. And then times, same idea, x to the power over root. Power here would be 5. And since it's a square root, 2 is the denominator. Now if I want to multiply these two things together, again, we have a little bit more work to do here on this one. I multiply these two things together because I'm not even in any position yet to, um, 
take a derivative. I need to multiply common bases. When you multiply common bases, you add the exponents. So really, this is x to the 2 thirds plus 5 halves. Well, I can't really add those two exponents together without creating a common denominator. Common denominator is going to be a 6. So again, I'm still haven't gotten to the point where I can take a derivative yet. So let's see. If the common denominator of 2 thirds is a 6, I'll multiply the top and the bottom by 2. So that's x to the 4 sixths plus, um, and the second fraction has to be a common denominator of 6, so I have to multiply top and bottom by 3, so that's 15 sixths. So really what I'm going to take the derivative of is x raised to the 19 sixth power. After all that, now I'm actually ready to take a derivative. So let's go ahead and take the derivative. So once again, dy over dx. Bring the exponent out to the front, 19 sixth. Reduce the exponent by 1. Well, let's see, reducing 19 sixths. So 19 sixths minus 1 is 19 sixths minus 6 sixths, which is going to give us 13 sixths. So the new power is 13 sixths. And the example answers were already posted there on this particular one, so you can check to make sure that we got these right. There is actually a mistake in the key. The answers that I put here are correct. The key actually, unless I'm just not reading that correctly, looks like B actually has negative 4x to the negative third power. That's not correct. That is incorrect. That should actually be negative um, 5 because you do have to subtract 1. So good thing I double checked that. All right, let's move on. All right, the derivative as a constant function. This is probably the one that should make the most sense. If you understand that the derivative is nothing more than a slope, if you have a constant function like y equals 3, y equals 7, y equals 10, y equals negative 2, whatever it is, a constant function is a horizontal line. So if we call this k, if that's y equals k, as you can see, the slope of that line is zero. There is no rise. All run. So the slope is zero. So the easiest thing to know is the derivative, because that's what a derivative is, a slope of any constant is zero. So if I was to take f prime, if I was to take f prime of x here, well, the derivative of 35.7, that's a constant, zero. Don't be fooled on the next part because that base e is a number. Pi is a number. That's just a number raised to another number. Therefore, it's just a constant. So the derivative is still 0. And then the last one has got 54 seventeenths plus 8. That's still all constant. So once again, the derivative is 0. So the biggest thing here is people see that and they think, oh my goodness, I have to bring the pi out front. Remember what I told you, the e part, that's a number. It's not x. The base is not x, so you can't use the power rule. It's just a constant. Derivative is zero. Easy peasy. Okay. So the derivative of any constant is zero. But what if we were to multiply a constant times another function? Well, the rule for that one is actually pretty easy, and it's a very, very useful rule. It says that if I was to take a constant and multiply it times a function, I can remove the constant and take it out to the front. So basically, I can take this constant and put it out in the front, and then just take the derivative of the function, which would be f prime of x, and then multiply the constant in afterwards. So basically, I can take the constant out, take the derivative of the function, and then multiply the constant back in. Okay, it's a really useful rule. Um, sum and difference rule. Very much like what we did when we talked about limits. You can split two functions and take the derivative of them separately and then add them um, or subtract them. Again, subtracting them, the order matters. Adding them, order doesn't matter. 
You cannot, however, do this with multiplication and division. This only works for addition and subtraction. Okay, very, very simple. All right, so these two rules allow us to take derivatives of many functions, including all polynomials. For example, find the derivative of f of x equals 24x minus the square root of x plus 5 over x. Well, as you can see, what I have is technically three different functions here all being added together. Well, the sum and difference rule just says take the derivative of each piece individually. Well, we're going to do that as we go. So we're going to do f prime of x. Now, technically, that 24x, that's a constant 24 times a function, x. So really what we're going to do is we're just going to take the derivative of x, which, if you remember from one of the previous pages, is just 1. So really what we get is 24 times 1, or just 24. Now, remember that that square root of x is the same thing as x to the 1 half. So when I take the derivative of x to the 1 half, which I'm not writing, it's in a previous section, I'm going to bring the 1 half out to the front, and then I'm going to reduce 1 half by 1. Well, if I take a half, subtract 1, we get negative 1 half. And then I am going to kind of rewrite this one just because it's not something that we're used to seeing. You probably want to rewrite that 5 over x as 5 times x to the negative 1 power. You bring the x up to the top and make it a negative exponent. So the derivative of that one is going to be, let's see, bring the negative 1 out to the front and multiply it times the 5, so we get negative 5, and then reduce the power by 1. So subtracting 1 from negative 1 gives us negative 2. And there is your derivative in example 3. All right, example 4. Find any points on the graph of f of x, which is graphed below, negative x cubed plus 6x squared, at which a, the tangent line, is horizontal, and b, the tangent line, has a slope of 9. Okay, so seeing on the graph where the tangent line has a horizontal slope is probably a little bit easier than seeing where it has a slope of 9. But using the derivative makes this very, very easy. Now remember if it says a horizontal slope. Horizontal, we want this thing to be level straight across the page so you can kind of look at it again and see like okay well if i look at like right here that looks like that's got a tangent line of zero right here that looks like that's got a tangent line of zero so we can guess that there's an x value of zero and it looks like probably the x value of four that's going to give us a horizontal slope figuring out where this thing has a really steep slope of nine again a little bit more challenging to do so here's how we actually do it. And this is going to algebraically show that our horizontal slopes are at 0 and 4. And then um, <clears throat> we'll figure out our, our, where our slope is 9 as well. If we want to find the slope of something, we take the derivative. So the first thing we need to do is actually take the derivative. So f prime of x is going to be, let's see, take the derivative. Let's use the power rule. The first one is negative x cubed. Let's bring the 3 out to the front and multiply it by the negative sign. So that's negative 3. Reduce the power of the x now by 1. So that's negative 3x squared. Do the same thing with the 6x squared. Bring the 2 out to the front and multiply it times the 6. So that's 12. Reduce the power of the x by 1. x to the first power. I tend not to write the first power because it looks like a, pr a prime symbol. So try not to write if something is raised to the first power only. That's just my, uh, my advice. Okay, but that's our, that's our derivative. That gives us slope. But we want to find out when the slope has a horizontal tangent. So if I want something to have a horizontal tangent, we want the slope to be 0. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our derivative here, which is negative, whoops, selected the wrong pen. We're going to take negative 3x squared plus 12x, and we're going to set that equal to 0, because that's what I want to know. I want to know when the slope, or f prime of x, equals 0. And then we're going to solve this thing. So it looks like to solve this, I'm, I can factor out a negative 3x, which is going to leave us with x minus 4. 
And then if I set each one of those factors equal to zero, the first factor, negative 3x equals zero only when x is zero. The second factor, x minus 4 equals zero only when x is 4. So that actually verifies exactly what we said. When x is 0 and when x is 4, we have horizontal tangents. But we're also interested in when does this thing have a, a slope of 9. So once again, I'm just going to take my slope or my derivative and set it equal to 9 and solve. Okay, once again, I've kind of done some of the legwork before. I can factor out that negative 3x. And, hmm, this one's going to be tough. I can't set that equal to 9 and solve this. Okay, one thing you have to understand is if you're going to solve one of these, you can't set this equal to 9. It's got to be equal to 0. So what we need to do instead is we need to subtract 9 from both sides. and then solve the quadratic equation. So the first thing that I'm seeing is I think we can divide a negative three out of everything. So let's go ahead and just divide the whole thing by negative three, which is gonna give us x squared minus four x plus three equals zero. And then we should be able to factor that to x minus three, x minus one equals zero. So that means that the x values have to be three or one. So when x is three, looks like right about here, and when x is one, right about here, it's saying we have a slope of nine. So if you were to draw a tangent line to those points, that's saying that you would have a rise over run or a slope of nine. Okay, let's go ahead and finish this thing off. This is our first real example of something that goes into the business world. Suppose that the cost of producing x units of a product is given by the cost function c of x equals 20,000 plus 7x plus 0.02x squared. What is the marginal cost of producing 2,000 units? Well, marginal cost is really just another way of saying derivative you find the marginal cost by finding the derivative. It is really just the slope of the next item that you need. So we are going to find c prime of x, because that's what we need. Instead of f of x, it's c prime of x. Well, the derivative of 20,000, that's a constant. That's 0. The derivative of 7x, well, that's just going to be 7. And then the derivative of 0.02x squared, bring the 2 out front, multiply it by 0 0.02, you get 0 0.04. And then reduce the power of x squared by 1, you're just at x to the first. But we want to know what the marginal cost is, which we've just found, at 2,000 units. Well, 2,000 is your x value, so what we really want is c prime of 2,000. So that's going to be 7 plus 0.04. times 2,000. And 0 0.04 times 2,000 is 80. So 80 plus the 7 gives us 87. So the marginal cost when we're at 2,000 units is 87. Or basically that's telling you that that's the rate of change or the slope when you're at 2,000 units um, sold. Okay, that should be good enough for um, this section. Um, good luck with the homework.